Hi, I'm Paul Duchesne. Welcome to Mama Paul's video podcast. Today is Saturday, March the 6th, 2021, and we're going to do part four, part four of the Powell Memo today. I've been talking about this for the last month now. The Powell Memo was a document written by Lewis F. Powell in 1971. Now, he was a uh, corporate lawyer representing the tobacco industry, and he became a uh, member of the Supreme Court shortly after finishing this, doc uh, this document. He was uh, appointed by uh, Richard Nixon. A buddy of his who worked at the Chamber of Commerce approached him and wanted him to write this memo or a document or an analysis and the title of it was The Attack on the American Free Enterprise System. Now my contention is that the memo is responsible for the Fox fake news that we have today and the dumbing down of America in general. My viewpoint is that the attack on the American free enterprise system was an attack on the corporate control of free enterprise, the corporate control over the democracy. It wasn't, people weren't attacking necessarily free enterprise and democracy, it was the corporate control of the free enterprise and democracy. It, it was more specifically a response to four basic uh, uprisings that were going on through, throughout the 60s. The anti-war movement, the uh, race riots that were happening, the women's movement, and the uh, gay liberation movement. Now the anti-war movement we were warned by Dwight D. Eisenhower in his departing speech about the military-industrial complex, which, in his early notes, he calls, I believe he calls it the war machine. Now, it was the last speech he gave uh, as president of the United States, and um, he gave it when he was walking out the door. If he had given it before he was walking out the door while he was president, he would have wound up like Kennedy, dead. As Kennedy stopped, tried to stop the war machine, and he wound up dead. And you can look into this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The, the race riots that were going on, because black people were trying to get voting rights and equal opportunities under the law. Well, that couldn't be tolerated by the white supremacists who were still maintaining separate eating facilities, separate bathing facilities, separate bathrooms. You went down south and it was separate this, separate that. It was nuts. And never mind that, but education, the black community had very little access to, to decent education. You get a black college here maybe, and but most of these kids didn't have much access to much education. And the, the lack of education was a direct result of the whole period of slavery. It was against the law for a black person to try to get educated. This was a fact, it was against the law for a black person to get educated. So they were trying to keep the black people in their place, as they all said. The third thing was the women's movement, which represented a patriarchy and keeping women in their place, another group to keep in their place and keep in their home. And the gay liberation movement, which was more patriarchy and probably a lot of self-loathing if you look at the number of closeted gay Republicans who got busted throughout the 80s and 90s, and specifically uh, Donald Trump with his little boyfriend, uh, Roy Cohn, who uh, he hung out with quite a bit, introduced to quite a few circles, and Roy Cohn was, everybody knew who his boyfriends were and his muscle men that he had on his little uh, boats and stuff. It was one of these obvious closeted gay Republicans that everybody knew was, but nobody talked about. And the last part of this, if, uh, if some of you might have read that piece I have on my website, uh, greenagevideo.com, I talk about the um, growing up in my father's bar in Manhattan, where the mob and the cops are collaborating together. The mob, the mafia, and the cops, the New York City police, are collaborating together to keep the gay community as an oppressed community so that they can draw more tribute from them. So there was a financial gain to be made from keeping certain people um, under the thumb, so to speak. The, uh, the corporatists took Powell's advice to heart, uh, literally, and they started building a powerful array of institutions, including <clears throat> excuse me, dozens of think tanks. And they were trying to shift public attitude and shape public attitude to embrace corporatism. They focused on education, 
uh, movement building. And by the time we get to the 80s, with deregulation and Ronald Reagan, we've got the evisceration of the unions with the uh, air traffic controller strike, and then we've got the sanctification of greed is good, as exemplified by um, Michael Douglas playing uh, the uh, corporate uh, raider uh, Gordon Gecko in the movie, I think it was from 1987, Wall Street, the Wall Street movie. In the opening of, of the memo, uh, William Powell quotes or talks about four specific people, William Kunstler, uh, Milton Friedman, Ralph Nader, and Theodore Reich. Now, I give him credit. I, I got to give Powell credit because these are four really good choices. William Kunstler represents the radical, violent left. Now, the radical, violent left became radical and violent after they were shot at by the FBI when they were unarmed. They were unarmed community activists who were feeding the people in the communities. They were attacked by the FBI basically for doing this. It's socialism. They were trying to feed an underfed population. The Panthers didn't pick up guns until after they were attacked. That's very clear. And at the end of the day, it wound up leading to what's, I think, called the WIC program. Now, I double-checked this to make sure that they didn't have the guns for that first year or so when they were in business, the Black Panthers. And it's, it's, I confirmed this uh, the other day with a couple of other sources. As a result of the 60s, they, the establishment was also looking to incarcerate uh, basically black men who were in the families. The goal was to break up the black family. Because they knew that the black family was a really strong, socially coherent unit. So the way you break that up is get rid of the men. So we flood the neighborhood with drugs. And this is all well documented. This, this went on not only in the 60s, it went on through the 70s into the 80s. Flood the ghetto, flood the poor neighborhood with drugs. Arrest the low-level users, not the guys that are supplying the drugs. You wind up breaking up the family and causing all sorts of social disruptions. Oh, God. And I listen to people today telling me how um, the black people are all responsible for their, their whole situation. And when you realize it was a concerted effort within the government, within the whole establishment, to keep these people under their thumbs, it, it's a real wake-up call when you, when you see the history of this thing. Ralph Nader is also the one, um, is also brought up as a major attack, Theodore Reich. <clears throat> now, Ralph Nader is the anti-corporatist who is trying to get some consumer rights. I mentioned this last week with the, uh, uh, the Ford Pinto blowing up, and they knew it blew up, and they, they, they calculated that it would cost them less to pay off the, uh, the people who got killed in the accident than it would be to change the assembly line. So therefore, Ralph Nader was a threat to the corporation. Uh, the other threat was uh, Theodore Reich, uh, the Greening of America. He was one of those smart, alecky, uh, lefty intellectuals who notices how alienating uh, life is in the corporate world, among other things. And he notices this new emerging culture uh, that's happening. Lastly, Powell sanctifies a Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman, as the a great defender of laissez-faire capitalism. Well, I, I've done this a few times now, and uh, the Forbes magazine 2013 issue called The Origin of the World's Dumbest Idea. Milton, let's go, I can slip it over. Well, i get it down here for a second. Squeeze it in. Uh, I, I probably held this up a couple of times. This was a big article in Forbes magazine entitled The a World's Dumbest Idea. And this is where Milton Friedman is attempting to make the shareholder the owner of the company, which Forbes said this is the most ridiculous thing they ever, they ever heard of. The world's dumbest idea in corporate lingo. So he's trying to make the shareholder responsible, and the only responsibility we have is to produce profits for the shareholders. The other dumbest thing from Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics is the whole trickle-down uh, trickle economics or, or supply-side economics, another real, real winner. Um, Okay, so those are the, the main people that, that, that he's, uh, he's uh, the three that he's attacking and the one that he's sanctifying, which uh, is uh, remarkable, remarkable. So anyway, we all thought it was going to be uh, the age of Aquarius and peace, love, and a, a brotherhood of sisterhood, and it was more um, sex, dope, rock and roll for some, 
and uh, a straight job and a family for the rest. I was in the second half of that group, sir. So last week, I focused uh, particularly on the introduction to the memo, which I've just sort of gone over a little bit. So let's get to the meat of it today with Powell's analysis of the corporation and the universities. So I'm into uh, about page six here, and <clears throat> excuse me. Under responsibility of the business of, of, of business executives. Powell's saying, well, what should be done? He's identified this problem, these systems being attacked. Well, what are we going to do about it? And he's basically saying we have to, <laughs> we're fighting for the survival of the free enterprise system. The survival of the free enterprise system. He says that corporate executives are responsible for maintaining a satisfactory growth of profits. Is that 3%, 5%, 10%, 20%? A satisfactory growth of profits with due regard to the corporation's public and social responsibility. If you look at the growth of corporations, you'll notice that their lack of social responsibility is stark. And their lack of public and social, it, it has nothing to do, it, it's their public relations campaign which has to do with social and political responsibility. It's the advertising they do about themselves. But internally, there isn't any. I, I've been a part of it, and I'll, I'll mention this a few times as we go along. I was in middle of the belly of the beast, AT&T, during this whole period. He then goes on to say, what's the role of the, of the Chamber of Commerce? Well, he says he doesn't want to see the corporations sticking their neck out and making themselves one particular corporation look bad or this corporation look bad. So rather than creating a target with a corporation, the Chamber of Commerce should lead this whole effort. Because the Chamber of Commerce is spread out through all the little small towns all around the country. And if they focus, then they can, uh, they can consolidate political power uh, over an indefinite period of years, put together financing, and come up with a national organization and a plan to fight all these problems that he sees that we have right now. He then goes on specifically to get into the businessman and say how they're apathetic. <clears throat> that business people are apathetic to the problem that's confronting them. The sad truth, he says, is that business executives at all levels are, a, by appeasement, ineptitude, and ignoring the problem. And this is where uh, he, uh, Powell does this a number of times here. There are, of course, many exceptions to this sweeping generalization. So first, he's, he's, he secondly says, there's a sweeping generalization that Business level people at all levels are appeasing, inept, inept, and ignoring the problem. He says that's a ex sweeping generalization to which there are some exceptions. Uh, I don't know how more contradictory you can get than that. In all fairness, it must be represented, recognized that businessmen have not been trained or equipped to conduct guerrilla warfare with those propagandizing against the system. Guerrilla warfare with those propagandizing against the system. The traditional role of executives has been to manage, to produce, to sell, to create jobs, to make profits, to improve the standard of living, to be a community leader, to serve on charitable educational boards, and generally to be a good citizen. These, they have performed these tasks very well indeed, says Lewis F. Powell. Well, like I said, as somebody who's sitting in the middle of AT&T during this period of time, ex from the late 60s till 75 almost, right through this whole period of time, let me tell you that AT&T was way more interested in making a profit than they were with improving anybody's standard of living, that they were in, or anything to do with charitable educational boards that they didn't have to get involved in. In fact, interestingly, this just came to my mind as I'm doing this, the big charitable board that they that they were involved with was the United Fund. And being a good corporate lackey, <clears throat> when I was there, I worked on the committee to raise help to help sign everybody up. So AT and T was signing up people for the United Fund, so that everybody could have a little, you know, ten bucks a week to, uh, taken out of your salary to go to the United Fund. So I raised my hand and I asked a question. I said, well, where's this money going? They said, oh. We're going to give the money to the companies that need it the most, to the nonprofits out there that are doing the best amount of work, they need the money the most, and we're going to give them the money. 
So I wind up with a group and we're touring around the city going to various nonprofits. And I get to a couple of these small nonprofits and they're hardly getting a dime from the United Fund. I find out most of the money is going to the Red Cross. What's happening is they're siphoning money off in between. They're getting everybody in the company to sign up to give money to the United Fund. It's not going to the small nonprofits at all. It's going to the big, big nonprofits where the bloated budgets are generally more than 50% of their bloated budgets are being spent on executive salaries. So it's another scam of them whitewashing themselves to make themselves look good. So when, when Powell says they have performed these tasks very well, I'll tell you, he's full of shit. He really is. And then he, he goes on to quote a memo that's in the, uh, uh, to General Motors. Uh, so somebody, uh, uh, an economist who I'm not familiar with, a guy named St. John, says, why not fight back? He said, the tendency of business leaders to compromise with and appease critics. After 10 years at AT&T, I have never once run into anybody appeasing anybody. He cites the concessions which Nader wins from management. The concessions he wins from management. They were blo blowing, cars were blowing up and killing people. And he's talking about concessions that they get from management. And then he compares that to the college admissions offices where they're appeasing things that are going to destroy free, free speech, academic freedom, and genuine scholarship. Well, you've got free speech going on in the universities. You've got academic freedom. You've got scholastic integrity. After 20 years, you don't anymore, which is why you've got all your cancel culture crap today and the rest of these nonsense things going on. The right-wing response <clears throat> to the hippie movement created a counter response which is worse than anything that we were we were, were trying to get done in the first place. He then starts talking about the campuses and he says the assault on the enterprise system was not uh, mounted in a few months. It evolved over the past few decades. And then he says how, how complex things are. So there's reason to believe that the campus is the single most dynamic source for these problems. The social science faculties include members who are unsympathetic to the enterprise system. They range from a Herbert Marcuse, a Marxist faculty member at UC San Diego and convinced socialist. Now, we all read Marcuse back in the 60s. We read One, one Dimensional Man. Marcuse was a Marxist who was anti-communist. He was a Marxist. That means he read Karl Marx. He read the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1848. He recognized the alienation within the system, and he spoke about it. Now, Marxism is not communism. And Marcuse specifically, in fact, he worked for the government. He worked for the government in Europe and did a whole thesis about how bad Soviet-style communism was. So, I mean, Marcuse wasn't exactly, you know, some raving revolutionary running around with a red bandana on his head saying overthrow the system. He was pointing out some of the problems within the system and the alienation that was developing among people who worked in it. I mean, this is, um, he, he's, so, he's, he's so uneducated, this guy, he's so focused and so narrowed on his uh, tobacco industry and his corporate control and everything that anything that threatens that Anything that threatens that has to be squashed and put down. Social sciences, political science, economists, sociologists, and historians tend to be liberally oriented. This is a statement he made. Even when the leftists aren't present. Gee, I wonder why that is. I wonder why people are, are liberally oriented when they're not working in a corporation and they don't have leftists push, pushing them that way. I don't understand what he's saying here. The difficulty is that balance is conspicuous by its absence on many campuses. Now, like I said, I was in school during this period of time. And, in fact, I was a Bill Buckley right-wing conservative who was a member of the conservative book club, reading the books about, about the conservative thinkers, and along the way, in the late 60s, there was this whole thing, which is, went off the next 20, 30 years, 
about how the Social Security system was going to bankrupt itself in a matter of like a year or two. This was common bullhorn coming from the right, that the Social Security system was undermining the country and was going to collapse from its own accord. I was doing a paper on this. Nobody was opposing me doing a paper on it. Nobody stopped me from doing it. I was encouraged, in fact. And I was in that little right-wing group. In doing this, I wound up going over to Staten Island and finding the group that was putting out all this information. It was this tiny little office in the middle of Staten Island with a hundred red, white, and blue flags uh, in this little tiny window. They weren't open. You had to call them to get anything. And I wound up getting their literature. And when you read the literature, it was, it was senseless. It was meaningless. It made no sense. For the next 20 years, the John Burt Society later evolved into the, uh, the Tea Party was proclaiming that Social Security was bankrupting the country and was going to fall apart that they couldn't afford it. I mean, stupidity, stupidity. That, that's what this is. He, he's talking about within the universities, and he's saying <clears throat> the reason that the, the students are dissatisfied to the point, are disaffected to the point of becoming revolutionaries because they were taught that way. They were taught that way. Now, I took sociology, psychology, economics, political economy, history courses, I never, never once, and this is, I'm not exactly talking about at City College either, I was at NYU in the beginning, and then Hunter College later on, and then the new school after that. And the new school, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand taught at the new school. You didn't exactly get a lack of balance anywhere in the academic uh, uh, environment, but you did get a more liberal uh, conclusion coming from anybody who thought things through that didn't have a corporation in back of them with a gun in the back of their neck. He, he goes on to say that the bright young men from the campuses, um, they, they want to change the system, they, blah, blah, so they, they don't do it, they despise it, they despise the system, they therefore seek employment in the real centers of power, which he then goes on to say are uh, the, uh, the media, they all, go, they all get jobs in the media, or they become government staffers. Boy, that's a, that's a terrible thing to do. Or consultants, or they get into elective po politics. They, they go out and run for office. Or they become lecturers and writers on the faculties of various levels of education. They did everything but join a corporation. They did everything but that. And therefore, they, uh, they must be all screwed up or something. Um, the news media, especially television, and this is this is the late '60s or the early '70s, and the news departments in the in the television uh, industry were still not profit-producing centers at the time. And nowadays they are. They completely flip flip the whole thing on its head. He said. He said the intellectuals end up in regulatory agencies. So the intellectuals who don't join a corporation wind up becoming a staffer or <clears throat> or getting into politics. And they end up working in regulatory a agencies with authority over the businesses that they don't believe in. He concludes this whole section here. If the foregoing analysis is approximately sound, well, I'll tell you, it's not approximately sound. A priority of the task of business is to retain the qualities of openness, fairness, and balance. Fair and balance which are essential to its intellectual significance. There is a great opportunity for constructive action. The thrust of such action must be restore the qualities just mentioned to the academic communities. So we have to go into the academic communities, take a little corporate lingo, squeeze it in, try to find some intellectual justification for it, and then sprinkle it back out at us. Well, we can't do it there, so let's create the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Institute and a half a dozen others. What can be done about the campuses? And he's got this little section here <clears throat> where he says how the chamber, the chamber can assist on the administration in the colleges. The chamber can, can help get qualified scholars into the university. The chamber can get a staff of, of speakers to articulate the product of the scholars who are working in these corporate controlled uh, think tanks and they can create a, spe a speaker's bureau so that they can supply the top of echelon of American business with 
people that sound like they're you know what they're talking about. And that's how we wind up with Rush Limbaugh. Literally. He is he, Rush Limbaugh, Michael Savage, a whole bunch of these guys are a direct result of this whole influx from these think tanks, which then trickle down this false information to these mouthpieces who, like Trump, are articulate in talking to people and creating a bit of a following. Whew. I'll tell you, I get the deeper I get into this thing, the, the more irate I get about what, what's happened to us today as a result of this. And I, I talked about this last week. How um, I'm going to end what we're talking about as far as the uh, as far as the document goes. We can get into the uh, uh, next week. We can get into the other venues that they talk about a little bit. It's going to be uh, publications and books and uh, uh, neglected opportunities in the court and how they can raise some money and, and those types of things. But from my perspective, what happened was this revolution was going on. Powell memo sees this revolution. It's like, oh my God, they're going to they're going to they're going to cause us to change our our way of doing business. We better do something about this. We need to change the mindset of the American people here. They're reading too many of these uh, intellectual books that describe what's happening to them. The alienation within the system, the separation within the system, the, the disparity between the, uh, the, the rich and the poor, and the continuously, in fact, from 70, from the time the memo is written, for the next 30 years, you have this huge gap between the rich and the poor getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So at the end of the 60s, you still had a reasonable middle-class American lifestyle for white males, specifically white males. In the office I worked in at at and I think there were maybe on a floor of about two or 300 people, there might have been two black men uh, on the floor and a couple of women who were mostly relegated to secretarial uh, uh, duty. So, from 70 on to the end of 2000, you've got this big gap coming, which uh, Thomas Piketty in his uh, Capital and 21st Century enunciates quite clearly. Okay, we've done almost a half hour today, so um, let's wrap it up, and uh, we'll try to finish this up maybe next week. Peace, patience, persistent, and uh, we'll see you as soon as we can get back on board here.